you may have heard the charge that creationism is not science because it's not testable, it's not falsifiable, it doesn't make predictions of future scientific discoveries. Well, we founded Reasons to Believe 29 years ago with that as a goal, uh, to make it a testable model that is falsifiable, and what you'll see this evening is how successful our model is at predicting future scientific uh, discoveries. Now, the debate is not about design. In fact, if you read the scientific literature, whatever discipline you read, you'll notice that you see the word design everywhere. The issue is who or what is responsible for the design. And this is how we've built our model. We specifically identify the intelligent designer and then build a model around that and then put it to the test and see how well it does. And there's two questions that we need to address in terms of trying to identify this designer. Is the scientific evidence for the creator's existence shrinking or growing as we accumulate more and more information and knowledge about the record of nature? And can we eliminate some or all the alternate explanations? So our goal is not just to establish that God exists, but to identify what kind of God exists. And I think you'll see the scientific evidence is potent enough to help us do that in the 21st century. Physicists in Britain were developing the first of what we call the space-time theorems. And I brought the first of those theorems with me here in case you'd like to look at it, the singularities of gravitational collapse and cosmology. It's this paper that launched Stephen Hawking to worldwide fame. And if you're fans of tensor calculus, you won't be able to put this thing down. It's just incredibly fascinating reading. <laughs> but it ends with a couple of paragraphs that you see up here in the slide that I think we can all understand. The power of this theorem is it's based on only two basic assumptions. The theorem is true if the universe contains mass. And as I look out at all of you, I see that you're each one of you living evidence that the universe contains mass, a couple of you a little more so than others. <laughs> the second condition is that the theorem is true if the equations of general relativity reliably describe the movements of bodies in the universe. Now, when I was reading this paper when it was first published, we could only prove the reliability of general relativity to about 1% precision. But today, we know it reliably describes the movements of bodies in the universe to 15 places of the decimal, to better than a trillionth of a percent precision. In fact, general relativity now ranks as the most exhaustively tested and best proven principle in all of physics. So there really is no rational basis for doubting that the universe contains mass or that general relativity reliably describes the movements of bodies in the universe, which means that we must accept the conclusion of the paper, namely that the entire universe can be traced back to a space-time beginning, which implies there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that created this universe. Now, that conclusion was not lost on the physics community. There are a number of physicists aware of this theorem who came from a non-theistic perspective. And they spent years of their career trying to find some way to escape the conclusion of the space-time theorem. And there are two in particular, Arvind Borde and Alexander Vilenkin, who devoted 10 years of their theoretical physics career trying to find an escape hatch. And over that 10-year period, they published five papers. And it concluded with this paper, their last paper, titled Inflationary Space Times Are Not Past Incomplete. Now, my wife is an English professor and says they need to get an editor to help them with the titles <laughs> of their paper. But what they wound up doing is coming up with a far more powerful space-time theorem, which says that any universe that on average expands. What they mean by any universe, it doesn't matter whether they've got an inflationary event in the early history or what's happening with the quantum phenomena. Any universe that on average expands has a beginning, including a beginning of space and time, thus implying a causal agent beyond space and time that brings the universe into existence. Now, they did find some models of the universe that didn't require this causal agent but every one of those models would not permit the existence of life. And if you want life, you have to be living in an expanding universe. That's going to any universe that expands. And they wound up concluding that all the universe is subject to the relentless grip of the space-time theorems.
which means it really is this causal link. You can actually read what Alexander Vilenkin is saying about the fact that there is this inescapable space-time beginning implying this agent. What does this mean philosophically? That no longer can scientists presume that all causes are natural. And actually, this means that we need to be open-minded to the possibility that the one that created the greatest miracle of all, I mean, what's happened here is that physicists have actually uncovered evidence for the greatest possible miracle that any scientist could hope to uncover, the coming into existence of all physical reality. And my point is, if that causal agent performed that kind of a dramatic miracle, sure is the possibility that he may choose to intervene at other times, which means from now on, science must be done with an open mind to the possibility that causes we're examining may be natural and may be supernatural or a combination of the two. Or to put it another way, some kind of God exists. And today we know what feature is most predominant in governing the expansion of the universe. It's something called dark energy. Uh, we thought that it must have existed decades ago, but it wasn't discovered until 1999. And now we know that this dark energy uh, makes up about three quarters of all the stuff of the universe. And it plays a critical factor in making life possible. Because if you expand the universe too quickly from the cosmic creation event, gravity will not be able to collect any of the gas in the universe to make galaxies, stars, and planets. And there would be no home for living creatures. On the other hand, if dark energy uh, were a little bit weaker than it is, uh, then the universe would expand so slowly that gravity would collect all the gas in the universe and quickly collapse it into nothing but black holes and neutron stars where the density exceeds 2 billion tons per level teaspoonful. A density so extreme that molecules are impossible, atoms are impossible, even protons and electrons are impossible, and of course life is impossible. But to have the kind of galaxies, stars, and planets uh, that an expanding universe would produce requires fine-tuning this dark energy term to about one part in 10 to the 122nd place. One in 10 to the 122nd power. Now, there's only 10 to the 79 protons and neutrons in the entire universe, so there's a mind-boggling big number. Now, likewise, this has not been lost on the community of physicists that take a non-theistic perspective. There were three theoretical physicists, all of them atheists, who looked at this dark energy and wound up publishing this paper titled Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant. That's another term for dark energy. And what I'm going to do for you is pull for you three quotes from these uh, three uh, physicists. They were interviewed by the senior editor of Nature, himself an atheist and a physicist, and what they said in the interview was that arranging the cosmos as we think it is arranged, says the team, would have required a miracle. Now, that kind of uh, got Philip Ball a little excited. You're atheist and you're saying there's this being that's making a miracle? And they went on to say, an unknown agent beyond space and time intervene in the evolution of the universe for reasons of its own, which explains the title of the paper, Disturbing Implications. <laughs> As atheists, they found it so disturbing that if dark energy is real, there's this causal agent beyond space and time performing miracles for reasons of its own, that they concluded their 21-page paper with this final sentence. Perhaps the only reasonable conclusion is we do not live in a world with a true cosmological uh, constant. Now, the irony of the paper is that it was published just months before we astronomers came up with nine independent observational demonstrations that not only is dark energy real, it's the dominant component of the universe. And here are uh, five of those demonstrations. Here are the other four. I won't go into the technical details, but if you're interested, I've written an article on all nine on our reasons.org website. In fact, you can go to that URL there 
you'll actually see a list of 25 independent observational demonstrations that we live in a universe where dark energy exists, and not only where dark energy exists, where it is the dominant component of the universe, makes up three quarters of all the stuff of the universe. And so, for example, we discover that all four of the forces of physics must be extraordinarily fine-tuned. For example, if you want life, it's crucial that we fine-tune the ratio of the force of gravity relative to the force of electromagnetism to within one part in 10,000 trillion trillion trillion. If that's not the case, stars will either never form or they form and they immediately explode. Either way, there's no possibility for life. And the, the list goes on. You have to fine tune the velocity of light. It's important that the universe have the same number of protons as it has electrons to within one part in 10 to the 37. Uh, the entropy must be fine tuned. The cosmic expansion rate must be fine tuned to better than one part in 10 to the 56. And we became cognizant of this in 1991. And so starting in 1991, we would survey the scientific literature and count up how many features of the universe and the laws of physics demonstrate this extraordinary level, high level of fine-tuning design. And what we discovered is the list has been growing with respect to time. And so what we have here is a table uh, that shows us how that fine-tuning design has accumulated uh, over the past uh, 20 years, where we've gone from 17 different features of the universe and the laws of physics that show this very high level of fine-tuning design, uh, where the list now stands above 180. And if you want to see the documentation, you can go to that URL, reasons.org slash fine-tuning. That will pop up a 300-page compendium uh, that lists uh, the evidence and then gives the citations to the scientific literature. Now, some of you might be listening to what I'm going to say and Fuzz is going to say and say, isn't this evidence God of the gaps? I get that all the time when I speak on university campuses. Well, there's always gaps. And what's happening here, people are saying, I will not believe until all the gaps are closed. Well, that'll never happen. We're never going to learn everything. But we can use the gaps as a test. The test is what happens to the gaps as we learn more and more. Do the gaps get bigger and more problematic? or did it get smaller and less problematic? And there's the nature of the gaps. Do the naturalistic explanatory gaps get more or less numerous, bigger or smaller, more or less problematic as scientists learn more and more about the record of nature? Now, I've addressed the physical sciences. Fuzz here is going to be addressing the biological sciences, but the conclusion we're going to be drawing is that for fine-tuning the origins of the universe, the origin of Earth, the origin of life, and the origin of human beings, the theism gaps are shrinking, while the naturalism gaps are getting bigger and getting dramatically bigger as we learn more and more about the origin of life, the origin of the universe, the origin of humanity, and the fine-tuning.